снова здравствуйте. Я снова рада приветствовать вас. Good afternoon. Uh, I welcome all of you again here at the museum forum. Российский еврейский. The one we organized together with the uh, Russian Jewish Congress and uh, Tolerance Center as part of the conference Protecting the Future. We begin our second section. And we'll start with uh, presentations, and then we'll go on to presentations, uh, to discussion, and we'll discuss one of the most efficient methods to counteract uh, xenophobia and anti-Semitism. Presenter Yonit Kolb, director of the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem, Israel. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the Russian Jewish Congress for having me here. It's a pleasure and it's an honor. Um, so I want to start with a joke. I want you to laugh a little bit. So a group of people standing on a subway platform, an American, Russian, and an Israeli. A reporter approaches and says, excuse me, can I ask your opinion about the meat shortage? So the American says, what is shortage? The Russian says, what is meat? And the Israeli said, what is excuse me? <laughs> and here you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Now you'll understand uh, why I'm telling you this joke, because let's start with my presentation. I want to start with a question about human nature. Since the dawn of history, we can witness that the tendency of human groups to separate and distinguish themselves from other groups is uh, very, it seems very natural. We always do it. Uh, ancient sources, and not just contemporary jokes, provide plenty of evidence for the uh, perceptions of supremacy, exclusion, prejudice, and animosity between different people and nations. For instance, I'll read you a quote, uh, a negative por uh, portrait of the armatories from the Sumerian myth, the marriage of Martu. Now listen, their hands are destructive and their feature are those of monkeys. They cause only disturbance. And another negative portrait of the Asiatic Knainates from the ancient Egyptian text says, But as concern to the foreigners, let this be said. The vile Asiatic is miserable, but is like thief whom society has expelled. The Asiatic is only a crocodile on its riverbank, which attacks on a lonely road. So if this is the case, and what we usually do is distinguish ourselves from other people by marking specific behaviors as something that represent other cultures and other society, perhaps this is our default, xenophobia. It, can we change it? Can we do it any differently? Now, what I um, would like to claim is yes. Of course, we can do it differently. But in order to explain my argument, I want to put on the table two terms. The first tor a term is paideia. Paideia is an ancient Greek term, means education, promote lifelong learning and curiosity. Uh, the Greek uh, were after perfection, were trying uh, to at least the Greek in uh, Athens, of course, uh, were trying to be always the best they can. And they believed that the way to be the best humans we can is via education, learning. The Romans can continue with this perception. And they um, had the concept of humanitas, Humanities, the quality of being human, the showing kindness and grace to our fellow men, was both an intellectual and practical virtue. The Romans believed that by learning, by uh, requiring uh, education, and by learning philosophy, art, and other discipline, this is our way to fulfill our human purpose and be the best we can. So... Having said that, us, 
as a museum, as institutions that provide knowledge, that uh, strive to expose uh, uh, people for new, um, new founding, new knowledge, and new theories, this is what we do. We want to bring uh, people to our institutions to let them know new things that they didn't know before. And I believe that by it being the, the first stage of our mission, we are starting to fight xenophobia. Now, the Bible Lands Museum. The Bible Lands Museum, in particular, uh, presents the history of humanity through one of the most important collection of artifacts from the ancient Near East, the lands of the Bible. Many people think that the, land of, uh, the Bible Lands Museum is about the Bible. No, it's not the Bible we're talking about. We are talking about the geographical arena, the lands of the Bible. All the lands that are mentioned in the Bible means Mesopotamia, uh, where Abraham uh, came from, Egypt, where the people of Israel were slave, uh, Assyria, Babylon, that has destructed uh, the uh, first temple. Uh, so all these countries are the countries that we are talking about in our museum. Our collection is mainly from this country. And the reason is that because the origin of the people of Israel started there. The uh, origin of humanity started in the near ancient East. And we would like to show how, how the people of Israel has, uh, and the nation of Israel was shaped uh, by acquaintance of other cultures and other societies that lived and surrounded them. The founder of this museum um, was a man called Dr. Eli Borowski. Eli Borowski was born in Poland. He was a Holocaust survivor who lost all his family uh, in the war. And when the war was finished, he was, he was broke. He was a brilliant man. And he, he learned uh, um, classical studies and philosophy. He was also a rabbi. He spoke fluent seven languages. And his vision was to tell a story through the museum, to collect all the artifacts that he did to show that us, the people of Israel, and the rest of humanity were all started from the same point. Don't wait. His motto was the future of mankind has has it roots in the past, only through understanding our history, we can build a better future. He wanted, he wanted to offer the visitor the knowledge of how our humanity has started, of where uh, the people of Israel had their roots. And he believed that if people will know the history better, catastrophes like the Holocaust will not happen again. And that's why he established the museum. When you enter the museum, um, the first gallery you'll see is the introductory gallery. Now, um, I'm going to tell you what you're going to see in the introductory, uh, introductory gallery, but obviously it's not supposed to make you not come to the museum. So it's just a spoiler. The first gallery starts with the uh, phrase from Noah's story about the sons of Noah. Um, as you probably all know, the biblical idea of uh, humanity's common origin uh, finds itself in uh, the Noah's story after the flood, when uh, the three sons of Noah are going to different direction. We have Ham, we have Shem, and we have Yefet. And um, basically, this is the beginning of the separation of humanity. The sons of Ham are uh, the uh, Egypt and the African nations. The sons of Shem are uh, all the Arabia, Israel, 
and this area. And the sons of Yefet is the, uh, the area more of uh, Greece and uh, Europe. So humanity has started in the same point, after the flood, the sons of Noah. We are all from the same village, whether we uh, are the sons of uh, Ham or whether we are the sons of Yefet. We're all from the same point. After stating this basic idea about the equality of people, the message that the museum and the uh, exhibitions is delivering is, is this. It's about, um, the, I can, I'll read it from the prophecy of uh, Ishaya, and I'll explain a little bit later. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion, and the, I'm, I'm sorry, just it's a little bit far away, so it's hard for me to read. I should have brought my glasses. <laughs> okay. Fuddling together, and a little child shall lead them. Ah! Two minutes? Okay. Vezeev garim keves in Hebrew. So uh, the purpose of the museum is to say, since we're all the same, we can live with each other. We can live in peace. We can uh, live right next to each other. And it's okay to be different. It's okay uh, not to be the same. It doesn't mean we have to fight each other. So um, the Bible and Museum also <clears throat> <clears throat> besides, uh, sorry, um, focuses also about the interconnection and the similarities, shows uh, the laws of Hammurabi um, next to the Ten Commandments, uh, the story, the myth of Gilgamesh uh, next to the um, Noah's story and the Babylon uh, a tower star, uh, story. I'm going to be quick because I don't have time. Now, I would like to focus on one project that emphasized the vision and the goals of the Bible Lands Museum more than all. It's called The Image of Abraham. The Image of Abraham is a project for a fourth grade. Our education department are doing it more than 10 years. The project, <coughs> sorry. Uh, this innovative project combines educational and social change for all involved and opens door for understanding and mutual respect. Thousands of Jerusalem Arab and Jewish fourth and fifth grade students met in the museum in the last 10 years. Based on the understanding of our common heritage, the, pro uh, the project themes are inspired by Abraham Ibrahim, Patriarch to the Jews, Christians, and Muslim. The series of meetings are different interaction between the children, between the Arab children and the Jewish children. During the tours in the museum, they learn about Abraham, they learn about each other's heritage and legacy, and they learn about common ideas in both cultures. Besides the children, there are the parents, and the teachers, and there are actually a few circles that participate in this program. And what happens in the end of the program is basically magic. No, just this one? Okay, play. Can we have a volume, please? أزعل خلص خلص أنا بدي أروح. Jusque sa 
sarcophage, c'est fait de pierre, toujours. These are called shekels. Um, on them say things like year two to the free world of the Jewish nation, first Jewish revolt, the Roman victory over the first Jewish revolt. Thank you. I saw yeah. that you went. So, uh, and actually, I had two more slides. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. We just don't have time. I guess they were. <laughs> we had to cut them down. Um, so, thank you all. Um, last sentence. Just come to the Bible Lands Museum. It's a great museum, and I'm really objective. Yeah, Please when come. Israel finally will let us in. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And we are we will be uh, traveling back to Armenia to uh, Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Yerevan. And here with us we have senior researcher and specialist Goar Hanuman, who will tell us more about the institution and their projects. Thank you. Um, the title of my uh, speech is Fighting Against Hatred and Xenophobia, the Mission of Armenian Genocide Museum Institute. Uh, is it work? Armenian Genocide Museum Institute was opened in Yerevan in 1995 on the occasion of 18th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. It is situated on the hill of Tsitsernak Albert and become part of the memorial complex dedicated to the victims of the Armenian Genocide, which was opened earlier in 19, uh, 1967. The first permanent exhibition uh, of the museum was opened in 19, uh, 1995. Uh, which was a huge success for the newly independent Armenia. Uh, the museum gave an opportunity to present a so far taboo topic, not only for the foreigners, but to the Armenian people. The new permanent exhibition was opened on the, uh, on the centennial uh, on the Armenian genocide and uh, was more large scale with a more in-depth analysis and, uh, of past events. 
The permanent exhibition of the museum presents the facts about the Armenian genocide. The emphasis is on how the genocide was pre-planned and implemented by the Turkish government against the, uh, its Armenian population, despite the fact that ordinary Turks were also participated in the genocide in various forms, the exhibition does not target the Turkish race. Uh, the aim of the exhibition is uh, to teach how hatred, dehumanization, and, xenoph and xenophobia lead to destruction of a whole nation and how important it is to react uh, on uh, such occurrences. The aims of the museum are being met also through the temporary exhibition, which are uh, being devoted to the separate topics, not all the entirely covered the permanent exhibition. We are also uh, online exhibitions on our website, and very recently we have launched also a project on a virtual tour uh, in, um, in the temporary exhibition halls of the museum. The Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute is also a research center where different aspects of the Armenian Genocide are being studied. The Museum Institute is an important hub for the Armenian Genocide research. In uh, furtherance uh, of this goal, the Museum Institute runs a postgraduate degree, PhD, and has special fellowship intended for foreign researchers to engage them into Armenian Genocide studies. Since 2010, AGMI, Armenian Genocide Museum Institute, has launched a Raphael Lemkin Scholarship Program for foreign young researchers and PhD candidates who specialize in the field of genocide studies and work on the doctoral thesis. The participant spends a month in Yerevan doing research in AGMI, as well as the local scientific institution and laboratory, uh, libraries. The scholarship program had has uh, 13 uh, alumni uh, uh, from the different countries, including Turkey. Since 2014, AGMI has established the Educational Program Department. As a first step uh, was summer school organized for the journalists and history teachers. Moreover, AGMI has published a handbook for teachers uh, on how to teach genocide at schools and another handbook for journalists on how to present the subject in the press. In both uh, handbooks, Holocaust was also touched upon. Uh, in uh, 2019, AGMI has organized an educational program also for tour guides. Tour guides. Uh, every year, hundreds of thousands tourists visited, uh, visit Armenia. The Armenian Genocide Museum is on the top of the most visited places in Armenia. Nearly uh, 100,000 people are visiting our museum per year. 80% uh, 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 of uh, being foreign visitors, of them being uh, foreign, vis uh, foreign tourists, uh, very often, not uh, only AGMI, but the other tour guides presenting the topic. So the educational program was aimed to address the issue. Because the Armenian genocide is not included in the educational programs of the most of states, not even in the frames of World War I history, people are, are generally not uh, acquainted uh, with the facts uh, and the history of the Armenian genocide. Plus, there is a state denial by the perpetrator state, uh, pe perpetrator state, uh, which raised the importance of the Armenian genocide education. Notably, among the museum visitors are also uh, citizens of Turkey. The, uh, the impressions are different after visiting museum exhibition. Some of them leave the exhibition with a great uh, sense of shame, but the others continue denying it and not accepting the historical facts. Every year, many students from the Armenian secondary and high school are visiting the museum, uh, which is a part of the uh, school uh, curricula. Uh, for that reason, starting from 2019, the Museum Institute uh, ha uh, has prepared a special program uh, for the school children. Thus, apart from a tour uh, in a title uh, in, in a museum, they are offered special topics not included in uh, the textbooks. AGMI researchers are presenting those uh, topics in the conference of all the museum, which is uh, followed by discussion with uh, students who raise a uh, question about different aspects of the Armenian genocide critical to them. 
And the, uh, uh, the latest recognition of uh, the Armenian genocide by states include references to education as a mean to fight against denial, xenophobia, and non-democratic values. Among those states were also uh, Germany, the US, uh, etc. Particularly, the uh, several US states laws have passed about uh, including the Armenian genocide in uh, uh, school uh, curricula. Uh, Phrasing the role of education, the Museum Institute plans to take uh, active steps in promoting this idea and assisting with, uh, uh, with its uh, resources and expertise. Now, we have uh, some first agreement with the Genocide Education Pro Project USA, and uh, the program will be hosting uh, in inaugural teacher fellowship program at the Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute in Armenia next summer. The aim of the summer program will be uh, to teach 15 U.S. teachers who will travel to Armenia about the topic of human rights, genocide, uh, with a, a particular emphasis on the Armenian genocide. The Armenian, uh, the AGMI, uh, will host all those teachers and our researcher will give several lectures. Our completing this program and the 15 U.S. educators uh, will pass their knowledge to skills to pro approximately 100 students per year, uh, the number of which uh, will rise each year. In uh, case of success, uh, the program will become regular. That's it. There were some technical problem, problems with my presentation. That's why uh, it's unfinished, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we are coming to Moscow, and I pass words to Anatoly Golubovsky, art critic, culture advisor to the president of the Russian Jewish Congress and a member of the academic board of Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center in Moscow. Thank you, Leah, very much. Hello. Since my presentation is in Russian, and you already have it on the screen, okay, very good. I will speak Russian, and I sincerely hope that we will not lose much. Well, I really like the idea of uh, I need to start a presentation with an anecdote, but uh, actually I will share with you one of the cases the Russian Jewish uh, Congress already has held uh, three contests of museum initiatives that are linked to the Jewish culture, history, identity, and so, so on. We are talking about uh, uh, Jewish uh, Contest. And one of the projects that has won a grant, I will talk about it a bit later, was implemented in the city town of Rinsk. It's a Siberian town located in the Kemerova region, 200 kilometers away from Kemerova. And uh, this town is a place where many correction facilities are located, so there is not much to see there. There is an uh, alcohol producing facility uh, that produces the most famous uh, vodka brand, uh, Beluga, and also there is a railroad running, by, running close by. But uh, uh, earlier, before the revolution, uh, life uh, of uh, Jewish people was very intensive there, and we can say that many merchants uh, that resided there were of Jewish origin, and they built the most beautiful buildings in that town, and uh, they were very active in the urban life, and they were true Jews at the same time, and the majority of them ended up in Siberia, in that town that was famous for these golden mines, and uh, they were actually in exile. They were regarded as uh, criminals, as participants of Polish uh, unrest. And uh, you see, uh, we decided to restore the story of Amrinsk town and we refer to it as a, a Siberian Australia, and uh, here we draw a very obvious analogy. So uh, there was an exhibition held there, and this project continues. Uh, it also won a grant uh, 
for Project killed Siberia and Jerusalem because it turned out that in some small Siberian towns there was a very intensive, active cultural Jewish life. And uh, to, for instance, in the city of Kainsk, um, today it's called the city of Kulbyshev, at the south of Krasnoyarsk region, actually it was referred to as Siberia and Jerusalem. And uh, so far it's, I have not come up close to my anecdote. So the project that won the third uh, contest is called the Siberian Jerusalem, and it uh, brings together four Siberian towns, Kansk, Achinsk, Mariinsk, and Kuybyshev. So, after the opening ceremony of the exhibition and the beautiful talk about Jewish merchants and their contribution, uh, I can say that we celebrated the event and one of the officials asked me, all right, and do Jews have icons? Would you explain anything to an individual who asks you a question of that nature? We had to explain that Jews do not have icons, but do you pray? Do you as Jews pray? He asked. Probably uh, yeah, you do something of a kind. And uh, I remember yeah, we had this wonderful talk and we were saying that yeah, merchants were so uh, powerful and had great contribu uh, contribution, but it turned out that the current citizens have very little idea about Jewish culture, about Jewish tradition, about Jewish lifestyle, and the social surveys uh, say the same, especially those held in 1980s, 1990s, and uh, the monitoring that was uh, held with Levada Center and uh, Russian uh, Jewish Congress talks about an astonishing number of people who would believe themselves as anti-Semites or were very impartial, but they could not identify Jews for uh, anyhow, be the last name, the appearance, looks, and so on. So 95% are simply unable to do so. So as we launched that contest, we realized uh, that uh, Russian history uh, is very interesting and unique um, in terms of uh, various brainwashing campaigns, in terms of uh, uh, eliminating Jewish culture. And actually, we can say that Jewish identity, Jewish culture, and uh, Jewish history today exist in some areas that are kind of separated and, not, and uh, from, from others. And, uh, for instance, I can tell you that there are seven or eight hundred uh, museums in the country that uh, regard themselves as historical museums, and they are located in the city, cities that used to have uh, large uh, and still have large Jewish communities, and uh, we can tell that many of these historical museums uh, do not include in their exhibition any information about life of Jewish communities in those cities, uh, even in the, uh, that includes cities where Holocaust took place, and uh, uh, or where there were prophets uh, of, the, uh, of the world, and they could become the public hero figures after all. So, with this in mind, we decided that our key priority priority for the contest uh, would be would be Jewish projects on non-Jewish platforms and we will uh, we would like to implement Jewish programs by non-Jews and if you talk about uh, uh, Siberia and Australia we can say that Mariinsky does not have a Jewish uh, community and the history of those uh, families uh, was uh, restored by 150 children from different towns and cities, and among them there was not a single Jew. 
So we understood for ourselves. Если можно, первый слайд. Can I show my first slide, please? Oh, actually, I do have a clicker. My apologies for that. Ох, у меня уже две минуты, а я вообще еще ничего не устроил. I have only two minutes left, and I did not tell you anything yet. Well, I can continue in the course of the discussion. So this is the first. The first project. Okay, you give you give me two more for all together. I will speak really fast then. Well, the first project that we tried to introduce, and this is a subject that is very much out from uh, the public uh, mind, and it was called The Saviors, and we showed this exhibition for the first time, and it is an inclusive uh, project, and you see in the center there is a cylinder that looks like sukkah, and here you see the plates of rescued and the righteous, and everyone could uh, come up and take a look, and uh, there are some blank uh, plates that say that the process of identifying the righteous is going on and it has a multimedia context related to the modern art. In particular, here we show the installation of Kus, uh, the artist Kuskin that is called the prayers. So all together it uh, created a very emotional atmosphere. And so people start finding out who the righteous people are because uh, they are glorified all over the world, but here people have no idea who they are. And this exhibition was shown in St. Petersburg, in Yekaterinburg, in Moscow, and actually it started in the Museum of Moscow. And uh, the reflection about uh, the generation of myth around uh, the Jews and uh, so uh, is uh, something that uh, we talk about throughout all our projects. And here there was uh, a very interesting exhibition that called uh, Face to Face uh, with Jews. And uh, it was uh, a gallery called Salanka. And here this whole idea was based uh, on the following. We understand that the Jewish idea was uh, hidden between the lines in the text, uh, and uh, we had uh, very strong projects, and by the way, today we are even shooting a video dedicated to this exhibition. Another interesting project within the second, no, sorry, in the first contest uh, was called uh, the Bromberg Violin Exhibition, and uh, it's this uh, uh, exhibition was held by Memorial Organization that is today referred to as a foreign agent in this country. So, by the way, we also issued a huge bilingual catalog for the exhibition. And and uh, here you can find a number of articles that are dedicated to anti-Jewish uh, campaigns in the Soviet Union that started uh, in the um, 1920s and lasted up to 1950s. Another project I'd like to mention, it took place at the Shapovka Gallery. The curator was Nadezhda Plungan. It's called The Wandering Stars, and it's a very delicate story related to Jewish identity, and it shows how it was uh, uh, blinking uh, uh, in the uh, arts uh, artworks of. Uh, the artists, uh, painters that lived in the 1950s, and uh, we also issued a huge book, and that's a research uh, where we explore the Jewish identity in the Soviet art. And uh, here you see a list of projects, of course, you're not going to read them all. But 
but you can see that we were able to support six projects within the first contest, and as we received additional funds, we were able to support as many as 10 to 11 projects each year, and they all continue living. For instance, uh, the project of opening synagogue uh, this project uh, is, was related to uh, opening a synagogue of uh, the uh, Jewish community living in the northern region and uh, sorry in mountain region in Ossetia and uh, opening this synagogue we can say that it um, continues uh, functioning and there we open many exhibitions uh, that are dedicated to interaction between uh, the peoples of uh, Caucasus and we hope that the festivals we held there will take uh, will be held on a regular basis and uh, uh, as for my reflections I will continue them during the discussion and I believe that all projects uh, related to xenophobia and uh, counteracting it uh, uh, well, all projects are very civil and they uh, go beyond the ethnic uh, theme and these projects uh, help people not love Jews or somebody else but rather help them uh, identify the right uh, existential choice we have to make. Thank you so much. As a visitor to all the exhibition, all the projects were absolutely amazing and I'm happy to hear that there is continuation and there is something that goes wrong after the exhibition is closed. It's Impressive. Um, now we're moving to Budapest, and I'm happy to give the microphone to Tamas Kovac, the director of the Holocaust Memorial Center. Thank you. Uh, I know our, and moreover, my time is very limited. Uh, that's why I will read my paper, which title can be How and Who Will Commemorate in the Future. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be able to attend this important conference and share my thoughts with you. I would like to point, point out that my presentation is based on facts and not dreams or ideas. Uh, I stand before you as a historian and director of the Holocaust Memorial Center in Budapest. So I have to say in my speech is not full of too much optimism. I'm sorry. I think a part of the education, especially the indirect education, is the commemoration. How we do it? I suggest let's go back in time to the spring of 1945. The war is over in Europe. Uh, Berlin was occupied by the Red Army, but the Red Army had previously liberated the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp and Budapest, including the ghetto. We know previously the Soviet uh, territories was liberated also by the Red Army and a special committee had collected the data of the Holocaust. I guess Ilya Alexandrovich Altman could give a detailed presentation of this topic. In spring of summer of 1944, 440,000 Jews were deported from territory of Hungary to West Majority to Auschwitz-Birkenau. There were 100,000 Jewish men in forced labor in the Hungarian army at that time. Thus, by the autumn of 1944, the only Jewish community lived in Budapest. They were forced into ghettos. At the time, uh, there were, uh, uh, were two ghettos in Budapest during the Arrow Cross Party rule, uh, where they were exposed to the atrocities of the Arrow Cross banditas. The total number of the victims of the Hungarian Holocaust is appro approximately uh, uh, 500,000 uh, Jewish people. We cannot say the exact number. So half a million people. We could rightly and for <clears throat> good reasons think that the society as a whole commemorated the Hungarian victims of the Holocaust. Already early, in 1946, commemorations of World War II were primarily about the liberation and the fight against fascist Nazism. Commemorating the victims of the Holocaust had become a kind of Jewish business from the beginning. Naturally, it's placed in the, only the synagogues and the Jewish cemeteries. But what could be the reason it turned out that way? 
One is that the returning Jews returned home to the cities, possibly the villages, from which they were deported. They had to start a new life in a community whose non-Jewish residents could even take an active part in, the, in their deportation. But there were even more who had won the material food or, uh, of the, of the uh, disappearance of the Jews. They, I mean the local non-Jewish habitant, could get an apartment, shops, workshop, and country uh, belongings. That is, the majority society did not do some comfortable remembering to deported Jews. In addition, in addition, the vast majority of the leaders of the Hungarian Communist Party were, well, uh, were known to the, have Jewish origins. We know, for example, many relatives of Rakosi Matyas, the head of the Hungarian Communist Party, were deported and killed in a different concentration uh, camp on Russia, racial ground. However, these leaders did not want to reinforce the image that Jewish leaders remember and remind Jewish victims. That is, this, in this sense, they favor the majority non-Jewish society. As I pointed out earlier, the political leadership talked about liberation of, liberation of Hungary and the horrors of the fascists in general. Despite all this, the assimilation of the Hungarian Jewry accelerated and the origin of the family became taboo in many, many Jewish families. More than 100,000 people emigrated to Palestine or Israel uh, by the end of the 1967 in uh, several waves. At the time, the diplomatic relations between the two countries were severed. All this also means that there were so few active memories survivors left in Hungary. We could see that the remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust was simultaneously tabooed and placed in the kind of inner ghetto. So Hungarian textbooks hardly deal with uh, these topics, I mean the Holocaust, generally crime of, uh, crime of the fascism or crime of the Nazism. A change in the culture of the memory began in the 80s in Hungary. Freedom in more and more areas or, of uh, life has also brought about change in the culture of memory. <clears throat> by, by the uh, 90s, it had uh, become natural for members of the Hungarian soldiers who fell in World War II, who by now became hero cult. Remembrance of the events of autumn of uh, 56 and beyond also became a product of the, this uh, decade. How has the memory of the victims of the Holocaust changed? Above all, it could now be uh, remembered openly. In uh, 80, um, 90, Sorry, sorry, sorry. 94, the first scientific conference uh, on the Hungarian Holocaust uh, organized in Hungary. Also this year, a temporary exhibition was opened uh, in the Budapest History Museum. Even then, there were plans to establish a permanent Holocaust museum, moreover a permanent exhibition about the Holocaust in Hungary, but the Hungarian government did not dare to take it on. Visible, Parallel planes of the memory form. Governments thought have now sent their representatives to larger commemorations and Ferras even made nice speeches. The theme of the Holocaust has become somewhat more prominent in the education. But on the other hand, many did not even in, in the last year, for example, 33% uh, percent of the Jews killed in Auschwitz camp were deported from Hungary. Societies still treated the victims of the Holocaust separately. There was a real change after the turn of the millennium. In this year, according to the order to the Minister of Education, April uh, 16 became the victims of the uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day in Hungary. The regulation was originally limited to the schools. The ordinance emphasized that commemoration is not mandatory. It should only be held if the school community thinks so. But nowadays, this day has stepped out of the school gate. The victims are now remembered at the government level on that day. Two years later, the Holocaust Memorial Center and Memorial Collection Public Foundation was established by the Hungarian government. Moreover, first, Orban government, and this, uh, this uh, public foundation operates the Holocaust Memorial Center. It is not only a Holocaust museum, but also an educational center and research site. There is a wall of the victims in the Memorial Center, 
one can find the names of the Hungarian victims of the Holocaust and inscribed on this wall. For many descendants, this, this wall is the cemetery where you can commemorate your destroyed relatives. Two years later, the first permanent exhibition on the Hungarian Holocaust opened at the uh, Memorial Center. Can we say that everything is be fine? After all, there is a Memorial Day, we have a Holocaust Museum, educational programs, and of course the local communities continue to commemorate it year by year. Moreover, Holocaust Remembrance is already, uh, <coughs> already uh, held uh, where there has been no Jewish community for decades, but not even a Jew. Commemoration has become more and more protocol-based. It must be included a minister, a secretary of state, a major, a local, or a member of parliament. And of course, their speeches are more important, especially for the press. The war, the war ended in 1945. Survivors, the eyewitnesses, are now worried. Fever and fever of them can remember year by year. What could we, uh, what could we hope for? In that the, the younger generation is not just learning the sequence of events for the Holocaust, but he also feels the historical weight of the events of that time, the casual system, and he feels the suffering of those persecuted at that time. Thus, anti-Semitism will, anti will not infect them. What's more, as a consequence of citizens, they will also take a firm stand against the germ of the anti-Semitism. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we're moving to Amsterdam, and I'm happy to give the microphone to Emil Schreiber, General Director of Jewish Cultural Quarter in Amsterdam and Chair of the Association of European Jewish Museums. Thank you. The, um, so maybe I give you a small introduction waiting for my, uh, for my PowerPoint presentation into the nature of the Jewish Cultural Quarter in Amsterdam. It's, uh, the, um, the Jewish Cultural Quarter in Amsterdam is a conglomerate of a total of five organizations. The uh, Jewish Museum of Amsterdam, we changed the name, dropped the word historical from our title, Jewish Historical Museum. It's now the Jewish Museum a week ago, so this is news. Um, the, um, the Jewish Museum is the leading organization. We have a children's museum which we now call Jewish Museum Junior. We have uh, the Portuguese synagogue, a 17th century synagogue, one of the most majestic buildings, Jewish buildings in Europe, uh, which we run and which before COVID uh, received up to 120,000 visitors yearly. The, um, and we have a National Holocaust Memorial and we're building a National Holocaust Museum, which we plan to open in uh, 2023. And Jewish Culture Quarter is the overall umbrella organization uh, for running all this, and I'm uh, I'm leading this organization. I'm still waiting for my PowerPoint, but the uh, whatever. Um, the what is important in the uh, um, what is important in the Jewish Historical Museum is to realize that this is an organization, Jewish Museum, that started in the 1930s. That in the 1930s, uh, I also have it on a stick. If you're looking for it, um, that is, I have it. I have it on a stick. If you need it. Because you seem to be panicking. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have your PowerPoint, thank you. Okay, here you are, send it. Um, so the Jewish Historical Museum was a museum that was a small museum before the Second World War and that moved into, uh, uh, moved into a huge uh, complex of four Ashkenazic former synagogue buildings in the city of Amsterdam. Uh, it was reopened after the war as late as 1955 and uh, when it moved into these buildings in 1987, it was decided that the museum was not to uh, reduce Jewish presence in the Netherlands, Jewish presence in the city of Amsterdam, only to five years of catastrophe. So it was, it was decided that it would, it, would be, uh, it would concentrate on four, more than 400 years of Jewish presence in Amsterdam rather than on uh, just the five years of the catastrophe. That said, thank you very much for taking care of this, the Jewish Culture Quarter. I think I schmoozed my way through the, uh, uh, through the, through the panic. Um, the, um, that, that said, there was always a struggle with the, what to do with anti-Semitism. As, as early as, as, as late actually, as 10 years back, 
my predecessors would say that anti-Semitism is the problem of the others. It's not the problem of the Jews. So why should the Jewish Museum uh, deal with the issue of anti-Semitism other than dealing with the Second World War? And there's always the fear, especially now also that while we're developing a National Holocaust Museum, that the, uh, uh, that the narrative of the Holocaust would take over the narrative of uh, so many hundreds of years of, of largely peaceful Jewish presence in the Netherlands. At the same time, this is a photograph from, uh, from two years ago. There's a kosher, and it could have been half a year ago, because there's one kosher restaurant in, in Amsterdam, Hakama, which is, which is constantly attacked. Uh, bombing, someone smashing the, uh, smashing the doors. Uh, and the typical reaction until recently would be, okay, the guy's a little bit disturbed, the guy t t did all the hammering. But he was also an anti-Semite, and people were afraid to say that. And we feel that as a, uh, as a Jewish museum, we can no longer just do exhibitions on, uh, let's say, 15th century Jewish painting in southern France, but we would also have to deal with this kind of atrocity. Um, and then, so I was thinking about what to do with this, how can we deal with that, and... Uh, then suddenly the world changed. The pandemic started, Black Lives Matter started, and it became even more prominent that Jewish museums can no longer be silent and that we have to do something about this. So I decided to invite, and we had already invited, a journalist uh, who wrote an article on why is it that anti-Semitism in the current discussions on racism, in the current discussions on inequality, why is it that anti-Semitism is so often absent from the narrative? Why is it that the discourse on, on, the, on the solidarity between all kinds of minority movements in the Netherlands, in Europe, why is it that anti-Semitism is considered, to use that language, a white narrative rather than another, just an, rather than another narrative of, of inequality, of racism, of uh, xenophobia? We invited here. Here's the uh, here's the journalist in, in back of there. We invited him, and it was a very activist exhibition. I mean, we used the uh, the the layout of the Black Lives Matter movement, as you can see, and we did an exhibition which we called "Are Jews White," which is quite a provocative title. People, not everybody, was equally happy with the title, but it, at least it arose attention, which is of course what you want as a museum. And we discussed the. The, 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 it was a small exhibit. We discussed all the current, uh, the, the today's expressions of anti-Semitism, all the anti-Semitism that we see everywhere. We also discussed the invisibility that I just mentioned of this anti-Semitism in so many of these movements that take care of the that take care of inequality. We introduced the Olympics of suffering. What is worse is slavery worse than the Holocaust. This is a discussion that is totally senseless, and it's a discussion that is going on, uh, going on forever. What is, what is worse? What, what, genocide, what genocide is worth? I mean, it's, it's, it's not a competition. It's not, a, it's not the Olympic Games of suffering. It's just a number of narratives that uh, can exist right next to each other. But people will always, we will have discussions in the public realm in which activists will say, there's been so much going on about the Holocaust, now it's our turn. It's not about have, taking your turn, it's about existing right next to each other. And then there's the issue of Jewish privilege and everything that's, that, is, that is connected to conspiracy theories. There's Holocaust fatigue, people are tired of the Jews constantly narrating out their, Holocaust, uh, their Holocaust narrative. There's the issue of Holocaust denial, which is of course true also of other genocides, the concept of denial. The Jews is perpetrated, it was mentioned for example, by a colleague in, in Oslo, the fact that in Israel, uh, many non-Jews will see Jews read the Israeli government and its, and its army as perpetrators, so how can they also be a victim of anti-Semitism? Then there's the so-called Jewish-Christian values that especially Dutch politicians play with a lot. Our society, our Jewish-Christian values are being threatened. Truth of the matter is that the Jewish element in Jewish Christian values is only introduced for the sake of bashing Muslims. I mean, that is the only reason why you would introduce Jewish Christian values. Is that the Jewish values are the, the values of our Christian societies. By introducing, by, by including the Jews, it makes it easier to bash the Muslims. The aspect of solidarity, where, why is there, and, and there is, why is there a lack of solidarity between um, 
the activists who fight against anti-Semitism on the one hand, and the activists who fight against racism and fight against xenophobia, who fight against uh, fight for for LH, LHBTQ rights. Why is it so often that so often Jewish activists don't feel comfortable, even if they if they're carrying a Magen David, if they're carrying a Star of David? together with their rainbow flag, they will be banned because the Star of David is associated with Israel. And they, they're activists. So this is also a form of anti-Semitism that's very, very problematic. And then we interviewed a, a number of people from, from, the, from all over the specter of, 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 political, uh, of, of political preference from left to right, interviewed them about, about this question, are Jews white? Not white, of course, in terms of their skin color, but are Jews white in terms of the... Uh, discussion that is going on. This is a very recent uh, cartoon. This is something that we showed there. And the cartoon is, this is actually a Jewish um, uh, a Jewish um, uh, poller, uh, someone who does the, 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 the polls for, for, for elections, for example. And he was shown to be ruling everything. And the cartoonist claimed that she, it was she in this particular case, was not aware of the slightly anti-Semitic nature of what you see here. I mean, how blind can you be? So this is something that happened. This is, of course, a discussion that is going all the time between anti-faxers and non-anti-faxers, the discussion. We have a political, right-wing political party in the Netherlands where the uh, Star of David, where the, the, the star is used, the yellow star is used to indicate that people who are not vaccinated uh, are being put aside in our society and can be compared to the Jews, which is horrif horrific, but it happens all the time. And we do a lot of other things. We, ha we, are, public we are planning a publication with essays on contemporary anti-Semitism. We do research in coordination with Jewish welfare on how anti-Semitism is experienced, not just by Jews, but also by other groups. It's, it's interesting to, if you ask a Jew if there, if there is the anti-Semitism on the rise, the large majority will answer yes. But it's interesting to ask the, the Muslim group, it's interesting to ask, the, we, we have over one million Muslims in Holland we, and we have 60 million people living there. Uh, it's interesting to ask youngsters, it's interesting to ask academics, left and right wing, what do you think about the rise of anti-Semitism? It's probably even more interesting than to only ask the Jews. We're developing a National Holocaust Museum, which of course puts the, and there was never a Holocaust Museum in the Netherlands, in this country that is considered to be so wonderfully liberal, which is not always true. There's the con continuous development of educational programs. There's the continuous contacts with developers of school textbook. Education is very important. And it's becoming a constant element of our ongoing program within the framework of the Jewish Cultural Quarter. So this was my presentation. Um, and I gave, I gave it back to Liga. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now have um, a short presentation a talk by our Macedonian colleagues, uh, by Mr. Goran Sudikario, the director of the Holocaust Memorial Center of the Jews from Macedonia, and he will present the project of the museum online. And then I will give back the microphone to Emil, and he will start the discussion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. From North Macedonia, can you hear me? Yes, please. You can start. Thank you. Thank you very much for the organizers for allowing me to present uh, the Holocaust Memorial Center for the Jews of uh, Macedonia. The Holocaust Memorial Center is a uh, non governmental institution specialized in preserving the memory of the Holocaust and, of course, Holocaust education. It's permanent, it, it opened its permanent ex exhibition in 2019 uh, with focuses on two millennia presence of the Jews in North Macedonia. Why uh, do we call it Holocaust Memorial Museum? Because it is built in memory of the victims of, of uh, the Holocaust. 7,144 Jews were killed during the Second World War from today's North Macedonia. And those 7,144 Jews represent 98% of the Macedonian Jewry at that time. And this is the, the highest percentage in the history of the Holocaust of murdered Jews in one territory. Uh, I will share a link about the uh, exhibition. So you can watch 
uh, the, the exhibition later on. It's a promotional uh, video. The Holocaust Memorial Museum, besides its um, museum's activity, it has an educational purpose. Can you hear me because something is stuck? Yes, we do hear you, but we don't see the picture. The, now, yes, it's back. Okay. Okay. It's probably the, the internet. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, the Holocaust Memorial Museum is dedicated in uh, engaging and developing uh, educational programs for school teachers from North Macedonia, but also for the region, because we're the only institution in the Western Balkans and Southeast Europe that is dealing with specialized in, in the Holocaust uh, education and, and preserving the memory of the Holocaust. And for that, we have signed memorandums of agreements uh, for organizing teacher training seminars with the Ministry of Education from Serbia, from Albania. We're working with the Ministry of Education with Bulgaria and with Greece. And for that, we have organized in the courses of, of years uh, trilateral and bilateral seminars with the teachers from North Macedonia, Serbia, Albania, Bulgaria, and Greece. And this year, for the first time, we are organizing a seminar dedicated for students. We have signed an agreement with the university, with the Faculty of Law from the Cyril Methodius University here in Skopje, to educate the students about the, the Holocaust and how to recognize deviant behavior in society so it will be never repeated uh, again. Uh, I, I would like to uh, say concerning the, the anti-Semitism, there is no official data about anti-Semitism, although we are recording what is happening in society, especially with the recent events that took place with the Gaza conflict, Israel-Palestinian conflict. And anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is rising in, in uh, North Macedonia and the, the legitimizing the state of Israel and its rights to exist also started to appear on the, on the surface in, in the society. Uh, we're dedicating, uh, that's why the Jewish community and the Holocaust Memorial Museum started an initiative in front of the Macedonian parliament to change the criminal code by which spreading of anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, Holocaust distortion and usage of national socialist and fascist symbols will be penalized by law, which was uh, accepted by the expert group. And we, we, we do expect that by the end of the year or beginning of next year, this is going to be amended within the criminal code. So uh, people who do deny the Holocaust or distort the history of the Holocaust or spread anti-Semitism will be punished by, by law. Uh, we're dedicated on creating a school project for, for pupils. One of them, I can, I can just mention one, is the Holocaust through the prism of children's size. We invite uh, schools, school groups and pupils to visit the museum. We gave them tools and they create, write an essay about what, what, what was happening during the Holocaust. They do research what was happening with certain family or certain figure during the, the Holocaust. They write, uh, they draw pictures of that and they create digital stories, digital films interviewing Holocaust survivors, but also bystanders and people who witnessed what was happening to the Jews and uh, educating them not only about the Holocaust, but the history of their own city and their own, their own country. So this is in short because I was told that I have only a few minutes to present the Holocaust Memorial Museum. If there is any question, I'm, I'm willing to answer them uh, gladly. Thank you so much. Now we're very happy that you join us. It's important to have a Balkan experience as well in this panel. And please uh, stay for the discussion that uh, I pass uh, again microphone to Emil. He will start asking questions and answering. Thank you. So I will, um, well, actually I will first share with you a couple of, of, of things that I have listened to, that we have listened to um, in, in this panel. And I, I will try to draw some some generic uh, or to see some generic connections between the uh, large variety of speakers. So first of all, you can see that there are so many different perspectives. I mean, the the, the perspective that we that are, is being presented by each of the indiv individual speakers is is influenced both by both by their 
that by the particular country from which they work, and, and from the nature of their institution. We see a combination of Jewish museums on the one hand, Holocaust museums on the other, on the other hand, and Holocaust memorial centers on yet another hand, which is, which is a different thing. I mean, we all have a shared mission uh, of, of trying to combat anti-Semitism, of trying to reach out to audiences, but we all do it from, uh, from a different uh, identity. I think that is something. And another thing that I see is that, the, uh, that there are a, a number of choices being made by our colleagues in the variety of countries. Many of, of us concentrate on the, uh, either the collecting of knowledge or the the uh, bringing the bringing the knowledge, bringing historical knowledge more than anything else to the public, um, whereas others invest in 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 research, invest in understanding what is going on, and providing professionals, providing machine professionals, and providing uh, providing uh, the, the the for example the press with the proper information. On a different level, one of the things that popped up in many of the discussions is the. Uh, the aspect of annihilation, of denial, of distortion, of genocides in general, of the Holocaust, but there's also the Armenian example, and there are also other examples that were being mentioned in the in some of the presentations. I think a common denominator of everything that we're fighting is the element of distortion and the liberty that our institutions feel or do not feel to deal with that distortion. And I think that is something that I would also like to ask to some of our, um, some of our uh, colleagues. And the other one is that we also, all of us live in different political realities. I, I, was, I think that was very, very impressive what our Hungarian uh, colleague shared with us. The political reality of the country in which you live will also define the choices that you make as a Jewish museum, as a, as a Holocaust museum, as a Holocaust memorial center, as an educational center on where you want to be heading. So I th and that was also very clear from the American uh, example that we had, or even from the uh, example from Israel that we had, that your your political reality defines who you are. The question that I have for any one of our panelists online or, or, or offline live here uh, is to what extent that you, do you feel that, you, that your, the freedom that you have to make your choices in, in, uh, in, in combating the prejudices that we all have to deal with, uh, to what extent do you feel that you're still free to make choices? To what extent do you feel that that the political situation in which you are um, is is hampering you, is, is hindering you in, in, in doing your thing? And maybe since I introduced the colleague from uh, Budapest first, maybe he would be the first to, uh, if he wants to, to answer. If he feels not like doing that, I can understand that as well. Then I can perhaps answer the question, ask the question also to one, some of the colleagues from, from Yerevan. So what, to, to what extent does the political... Okay, so we asked the president, the, maybe the, our colleague from Yerevan, you, you would like to respond to that because you made a very sincere political statement as well in your speech, so you might want to uh, elaborate on that. Well, uh, I, I, uh, I was talking about the situation connected with Azerbaijan. I know, Inside I know. Armenia, we do not have any problems. Inside Armenia, we do not have any problems in uh, talking about the genocide, uh, presenting everything and as I told already, we are planning to show also other genocides because Armenians are concentrated on Armenian genocide. So we need to tell people that uh, during uh, the, the last, at least the last 100, 120 years, uh, another genocide in the world took place. And we, uh, we need to learn about them as well. As much as we know, of course, maybe not the same level of knowledge we can uh, present, but uh, as much as possible. And uh, that is one of the uh, 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 serious elements for the, uh, for the tolerance and uh, to fight against xenophobia. So you need to learn about the other issues. That is our approach. Thank, thank you. And, and to what extent, for example, in, in San Diego, um, to what extent would, would you I mean, because you, you speak very clearly about, about other atrocities and you made a conscious decision to go there. Um, uh, to what extent do you, do you also 
experience a backlash? To what extent do people object to that? We had a situation in Amsterdam in which someone was willing to give us a 1 million euro donation for the National Holocaust Museum if we changed the name into National Genocide Museum. We didn't. But to what extent do you feel, do you feel the liberty to deal with other genocides? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so our museum decided that we were going to, and you may have heard me say this earlier, lead with love. <laughs> you don't hear that a lot. But really it was a building of trust with the community. Our decision to do truth telling, this is a, a very important point, is that we have taken this role where we are, that will come first. That we will be doing truth telling and that allowed us a lot of freedom. And we decided that, that despite you know, political backlash or donors deciding not to donate to the museum, um, board members deciding to step aside, people calling and emailing the museum about our name change um, all over the country, um, and making that politically partisan even, just making it a president, the current president to the former president, making an issue which was, of course, not even related. Um, it gave us a lot of freedom because we made that decision. So for us, we um, lost a lot of donors, a lot of money. No, we didn't take that, like the example you just gave. That must have been so difficult, but you knew what was right and you knew what you wanted to do. And once you decide that you've stick to those ethics, and those values, um, there is a lot of freedom, but there is, that means you just have to work a lot harder. And that for us, um, finding, there's a ton of donors out there who will donate based on the values that, you, that we've decided to, to lead from. And so we feel actually that we have a lot of freedom, just have to work a lot harder. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just got an indication that our colleague from Budapest, other than I thought, is actually willing to answer to the, uh, to the earlier question. The floor is yours. Yes. Um, you should know in Hungary, every single question is a political question. So do you prefer white wine or red wine? This is a political question. That's why I prefer rosé wine in Hungary. Uh, so it was a political decision. Yes, we have an own Holocaust Memorial Day. It was a political decision. Yes, we would uh, like to build or establish um, a Holocaust Memorial Center. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's exactly a museum, but a memory, our memorial center. So yes, I think uh, the, the politicians is very important for this topic. And uh, I think... Uh, I think um, without political decision, we haven't got, I mean in Hungary, we haven't got um, a dedicated Holocaust Museum, Holocaust Memorial Center. Uh, we haven't got uh, on uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. And I think it's important because I hope uh, these decisions a bit educated the society as well. Okay. So uh, I would I would also like you, our colleague from Dubai to to also uh, what interests me a lot is we were talking about political backlash and we know that the the, the political relations between Israel and the Emirates have have improved a lot. Yeah. Your initiative is a is a private initiative. How did you experience the political pressure? Yeah. Um, having a private was there any was there any what's that was there any yeah. was there any political pressure? No, not at all. There's no political pressure. Uh, as you know, the museum is a private, is a privately owned by me, and I'm the creator and, the, and also the, the founder. But uh, the house is a public house. It's a historical building, the Royal Historical Building, that was uh, which we had. The museum had been open since 2012, and we had many items from Israeli items and Jewish items, and from uh, Christianity because the monotheistic thing there a lot of there. So the culture, uh, 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 the culture there helps a lot. It's not a political decision about this one because we don't have anything political in that area. The political, uh, the whole idea is we're showing compassion. Uh, we talk about the peace, you know, it's a, it's a fully. It's not just peace politically. It's not just economically. It's also the soft aspect, culturally, uh, feeling for each other. So, um, in fact, I was uh, I, I did not approach any media, but the article which were written in the country about the Holocaust Gallery. Uh, was very good article from within the country. The only attacks happened from extremists, you know, from certain groups, like the people like it has to do with Iran or from Al Jazeera, for example, or Hezbollah, or from the Muslim Brotherhoods. 
These are the ones who are you know, outside. These are the ones who criticized uh, this. And also, interestingly, uh, there was no complaint from other embassies or other places. Okay. You know, there was no political pressure, internationally or regionally or locally. Uh, it's, the whole thing, we use the same values. The values that you shared. You know, it's uh, the religious values, uh, the cultural values, and the kinship values. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we did, for example, a very beautiful conference called Rebuilding the Abrahamic Tent, based on historical kinship and future alliances. That's what we are doing there. Mm. It goes very well with the culture, with the sociology and there. That, that also, that actually, thank you, because that actually also leads me to, to, to education and to, there were quite a few colleagues, the colleagues from Oslo, the colleagues from the Bible Lands, the colleagues from Yerevan, the colleagues from, from a, a number of other places that, that concentrated on the, and also from Moscow, the, 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 the aspect of, uh, of, of education. I would first like to ask the colleague from, from Oslo, maybe, and also in Pauline, by the way. Pauline is, is all about education. The, uh, I would f first of all ask the, uh, the, the colleagues, to, to what extent do you feel that, that, the, the, that presenting groups of, uh, groups of pupils, groups of students with, with historical fact, uh, how, do you, how do you manage that they do not only digest the information, that they, but that they actually uh, do something with it. I think that what at the end of the day is important when you talk about education is how you reach out to the students, not only by providing them with the information, but also by providing them with the means to act with the new knowledge that they have. How do you do that? I start with Oslo, I think, and then maybe Pauline, and then from Pauline we can move, uh, well, we can move anywhere, I mean, probably to the Bible lands, because one of the things that strikes me uh, when I listen to, to many of you, and that's not because you may not do it, but because I didn't hear it, I think that what is vital in the, in the, in while, while, this, while talking about the education and while trying to reach out to youngsters, is to first understand with what preconceptions they come into your house. What do they think about Jews? What do they know about Jews? What do they think that they know about Jews? What do they think that they know about the other? Before you tell them what Jews are, and I, let's let's start with our colleagues in Oslo, and I will try to try to give the word the floor. So don't talk too, talk too long. We don't have a lot of time, uh, but give give us the, the the essence of what you feel, Oslo. Someone should unmute Oslo, otherwise we will not hear Oslo. Yeah. Oslo. Unmute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you do you hear yeah. me? Yeah, okay. I think Kjetil is the one who really meets uh, the students. I meet a lot of the uh, elderly people, yeah. <laughs> and the real grown-ups. So uh, Kjetil, you have had a lot of uh, um, classes, really, uh, and also, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one students uh, for your, uh, your um, presentations. So um, yeah. is it possible for you to answer? Could you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, actually young people knows a lot more uh, at present than they did uh, um, um, did um, uh, several uh, earlier decades because uh, well Holocaust and uh, Jewish history and uh, the history of antisemitism and so on are, are really uh, has really been. A much, uh, I've, I've got a much uh, more important part in the Norwegian, public, uh, the, the Norwegian public and also in the research, historical research. So when you compare present um, uh, books for uh, school pupils, for example, with, uh, uh, with books from the 70s and the 60s, uh, a lot more are told about the Holocaust in Norway, for example. So, at the same time, they don't have the same, uh, <laughs> this, the, uh, obviously, um, they don't have this, the same, don't have the same experience with, for example, uh, people that have uh, lived through the war. Uh, uh, so, so, so it's uh, John space, but I, I think they know more actually to, today. Uh, and uh, education about this subject has also to a much more large, larger degree than uh, earlier been a part of the public uh, uh, public education program in Norway. 
So, uh, but I, I also think perhaps that um, that the classes and the student groups that visit us are more interested than uh, and also a bit uh, more uh, resource uh, have, have more research uh, resource. Uh, strong resources than than the common or uh, pupils or classes in a way. So it's a bit difficult to know exactly. Uh, how how is that in, in thank you thank you? How, how is that in another country that uh, in which everything is political? Poland. Um, our our yeah. colleagues from Pauline. How uh, to what extent do you do you thank you so thank you Oslo. Um, to what extent Pauline do you do you our colleague from Pauline? How to what extent do you I think that uh, you um, and that's that's Dagmar. To what to Dagmar, to what to what extent do you th ask your pupils with what preconceptions they come to you, and how does that influence the way that you address them? Because I think that's really vital. Okay, I will start. We do not ask direct questions. You know, it's it's not we are asking the questions. Uh, if you have a pupil or you have an adult, because education is not only addressed to pupil, we are, we are addressing all different audience, and we are not asking the questions what prejudices or what stereotypes do you have, because majority of people will answer, will answer I don't, and uh, the same way probably we would answer. So generally we try to work with the audience, with the group, to try them to discover by themselves if they have any stereotype and how they can define it and how they can deal with this. This is how, how we try to, to act. Like, for example, we do the workshops using uh, part of the exhibition. We work on the exhibition on the subject of, I know, Second Poland Republic antisemitism. So we show the mechanism on the numerus clausus or ghetto bench or uh, economical boycott. We discuss this uh, this issue, the subject. We show what were the mechanism, what were the superstitions uh, or stereotypes hidden behind this event. And then we discuss with the, with the, uh, with the group uh, contemporary uh, surroundings, if they see something uh, similar, if they can uh, define similar mechanism or acts in their surroundings, in the classroom, etc., etc. Okay, thank you. I don't know if it happens. Yeah, I would also like to ask a question to the Babylon Museum because it's it's uh, you have a totally different group of of uh, students that will typically come to you. You showed us this wonderful uh, video. You showed us an Arab group that that, that uh, dealt with the communality in Arab speaking group with uh, dealt with the communality in in, in traditions. Uh, there too, my question is: to what extent would uh, to what extent does the historical approach that you have and the introduction? of historical notions of communality, to what extent does that uh, relate to their everyday experience of living in Israel, I suppose, in this particular case? Um, if we're talking about education, I think that the stuff. Especially for uh, young, especially for teenagers that are used to have screens, is you have to ask them to imagine something that doesn't exist anymore from a small stone or a, from a tiny artifact and you tell them a great story about a, a fabulous empire and all they see is something small that looks maybe not so beautiful, not so impressive. So what we are trying to do um, is go the other way. We're trying first to understand their world. What is interesting for them? What uh, makes them be curious? Uh, what they want to know? For 
instance, uh, one of the things that uh, is being spoken a lot in Israel is about being a startup nation, an innovative nation, about lots of uh, new ideas and new technique. So what we're doing is starting from the present. For instance, um, um, in Israel, uh, a technology to purify water called Hatpala was invented. We are showing them how it's not just today. The ancient world did it too. We are showing that, that astronomy, math, uh, the transcript, it's all started in the ancient world. We didn't invent anything new. We just make it more sophisticated or uh, suitable for today. But we try to think first what they want to know. And then we open a window for the ancient world. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Maybe, maybe this is a nice move towards uh, Vilnius, where, where, where I suppose that you will also have a, and you, also, you already told us, large groups of students coming in, but that brings us back also to the last uh, last topic that I think will fit into the time schedule that we have, uh, which is the the aspects or the aspect of, of commemoration. I think it was a very important point made also in Macedonia, but also in uh, uh, otherwise, that, that through commemoration you can actually also, uh, how, how should I say, activate youngsters to start to think about the problems that we're dealing with. And to what extent is commemoration part of your educational programs? I would like to ask that question to Vilnius, to Macedonia, and then end, I think, justifiably with, with Moscow. Um, so maybe, maybe first in Vilnius. Okay, thanks. Uh, before answering your question, I'd like to say uh, that um, in our country, we have this issue with competing historical memories uh, because um, many visitors who come, especially teachers, uh, they um, um, have this attitude that um, Soviet crimes uh, are uh, should be spoken about more because this was part a big part of Lithuanian suffering. Um, slightly this is changing because Jewish history, Lithuanian Jewish history and what happened is uh, being more and more integrated in a general Lithuanian history and we can see this change over the last uh, several decades but still, you know, sometimes we have this um, experience when groups come with a visit, we see that uh, Teachers, they come not prepared, unfortunately, to hear what they will be told. And uh, so we have different experience on that. Though uh, also uh, there is a very positive change that many schools around the country, they have so-called uh, centers of tolerance, uh, which um, take uh, most active teachers to uh, do a lot of practical work uh, in commemorating Lithuanian Jewish past. Uh, they go to the Jewish uh, cemeteries, they clean it, they do different uh, interactive uh, sessions, plays, they uh, travel to see the authentic killing sites. So there is a lot of good positive changes. Um, talking about commemoration, lately uh, commemoration um, initiative goes to the communities, goes uh, not only as uh, our colleagues also have spoke, colleague from Hungary, that a big part of commemoration, uh, the most importance is being given to officials, to, you know, all these uh, speeches and, and very formal side of commemoration. But on the other hand, uh, in Lithuania, last several years, uh, community is more active. So these initiatives are coming from uh, from the society, from the, from the community, which is a very positive sign, I think. Um, and uh, of course, you know, bringing children to the commemoration, you have to prepare because if they come not understanding where they came, what is the site they have been brought to? What was happening in the site? They will just stand there, just see their mobile phones. You have to prepare, you have to invest some time and efforts to do this preparatory work. I think it is very important. So um, 
so maybe this is my answer. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you very much. I think I think I can ask the same question to our colleague from Macedonia, and then uh, from there, especially since he only he was so disciplined in only using a few minutes, I'll give him another minute or two, and then I'll uh, I'll give the last word as opposed to our uh, colleagues from Moscow because that's where we are. They were they were part in organizing this uh, this session to begin with, uh, so please go ahead, Macedonia. Yeah. Feels, the, feels like you're you for the song, question. Contest, song contest, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. yeah, North Macedonia. Thank you for the question. Well, the commemoration and Holocaust education is a bit politicized in in these days in North Macedonia due to the bilateral issues that the country is facing with our eastern border, Bulgaria. Our accession to EU, you know, have been blocked for years now. And uh, the Holocaust in North Macedonia happened thanks to the Bulgarian occupation. Bulgarian forces were responsible for evicting the Jews from their houses and deporting them to the killing center of Treblinka. And this is a fact that everybody knows in, in the country. But unfortunately, our eastern neighbor is not willing to admit and to apologize and recognize what their predecessors during the Second World War did. So, in a sense... It hurts the Jewish community, it hurts the Holocaust survivors because they would like to see some kind of reconciliation and recognition by the perpetrators what happened during the Second World War. Uh, what is also very important to say that uh, in 1945, the Jewish community started its commemoration activities when they learned what happened to their families, their loved ones, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, neighbors who were killed uh, in in, uh, during the, the Holocaust. The Holocaust Memorial Center and the Jewish community plays, of course, the leading role in, in organizing this memorial commemoration events. And uh, as my predecessor said, the society is also taking part in, in organizing and, and doing something in memory of the victims during the Second World War. What we are trying to do in this uh, process, when we speak with students in the educational process, we teach them about how to be upstanders, because 98% of the Jews have been murdered. And why was that? Because many people were blind or turning their blind eye or listening with the deaf ear what was happening to the, to the Jews. So in order not this to be repeated again, when the children come to the museum, they have many aspects through the exhibition to see how they can improve the society so we can live in a healthy environment, speaking up when we see um, unjust being done to, to a certain group of people in the, in the society. Okay, thank you very much. I, I will never make the mistake for North Macedonia, Macedonia as of now. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. So I, let's, let's move to, uh, to Moscow. One of the things that struck me first when I first heard about the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center is that in a way the uh, word Jewish, words Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center might be considered synonymous, but the interpretation of Tolerance Centers and Jewish Museums is totally different. So how do our mutual colleagues see that they manage to, uh, well, to, to reach the goal of that ambitious mission? I'll answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we, we're struggling with our naming, with the title, because no one here calls us rightly, nobody calls us Jewish Museum. Everybody calls us Museum of Tolerance. And we always have to correct them that we're a Jewish Museum and a Tolerance Center. Um, and it's a question next year we will compete our 10th anniversary and we put it as a question so maybe we should change the name but no in general we have kind of two roots of uh, working in an educational wise we have tolerance center with which a little bit independent from the museum and it has their own educational programs working with battling against xenophobia and racism and anti-semitism is just a small part of their work they don't mention it independently. It's all more about cultural diversity and about Russia as a multicultural country and how we should appreciate uh, different nations and how we are all actually the same, but we sh also diverse, yes, and we have to work with it and educate that. And they work with different uh, questions of uh, violence, about bullying, about, and they have very good uh, entrance um, to, to the schools. It's, it's, um, it's a general problem in Russia with Ministry of Education and with the educational system that school groups are allowed to visit museums only organ organized by school. And it's really 
tough, difficult for schools to do those work. It's kind of extracurriculum and it takes another effort and they're not willing sometimes to do that. And actually it's better for to go to the art museum or historical museum than Jewish museum. So, but the Tolerance Center has a success to schools and colleges and students, so they work massively with these school groups. The Jewish Museum, as the museum, works differently. We don't do, we, we of course do some educational program about Jewish heritage, about Holocaust, but it's just a little part of our educational system. And we decided that we will do um, more cultural, we will be more the cultural center and we will do different educational programs so the children would come to learn English, to learn play chess, to spend time. We have kind of a, uh, a daily kindergarten system. We have reading groups for teenagers and now we kind of restart our teenager programs to give the space this uh, lively um, attitude so you can come to Jewish Museum, spend your free time and this attitude toward the Jewish the word Jewish in the title would change because we, our marketing um, our research showed that we have struggle, we, we struggle with attracting new visitors. They really don't understand why sh they should go to the Jewish museum, what they will find. But when once they enter the space of the museum, they like it, they learn a lot, they enjoy it, and they come back. And our goal to change this attitude toward the first word in our naming. I think maybe... Uh, yeah, maybe Anatoly totally wants... Uh, now we'll give you the last... You, you also haven't said anything, but we are, we are running out... You have the last word, because we're running out of time. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a great responsibility for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have the, la yeah, the final word, and, 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 and everybody will take your last word with them home. Oh, so, okay. So go ahead. Responsibility is the main, uh, uh, the main term in my, in my, uh, in my you know, thesis uh, I know, right now. I know, and, go ahead. Uh, um, I'd just like... Uh, so, uh, you know, Russia is also uh, uh, the country where everything is politics. And uh, just like uh, Hungary and Poland and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, here in Russia, the problem of uh, commemoration of Holocaust is also deeply politicized. It is not politicized, uh, you know, publicly, yeah? But uh, uh, I mean the political atmosphere and some trends which uh, uh, do not, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, leads to the situation where we uh, here in Russia we do not have uh, uh, the Museum of Holocaust or Holocaust Center. We ha we do have Holocaust Center, but it is a small uh, research institution, and we do have a small exhibition uh, uh, in the Memorial Synagogue, uh, just uh, you know, here in Paklon Gara, uh, but it is not a museum. Uh, I guess it is not uh, the lack of e e initiatives or uh, activists. It is the lack. Uh, it is. Uh, mm, uh, the result of uh, the situation when uh, the problem of uh, responsibility and guilt is out of the official agenda. Mm -hmm. And it is a very important problem. Uh, uh, and it is a political problem. Uh, for example, uh, the, the this is the... Uh, and uh, uh, I was talking about... Uh, about uh, the history of the Russian uh, writers of nations. Uh, uh, this theme is absolutely uh, is absent in 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 the public uh, you know discourse uh, in our country. And I guess that one of the uh, explanation of this is that uh, uh, writers of the nations is the phenomenon of uh, self-organization. Uh, without any ruling role of, of uh, party or some uh, official, uh, some officials, and uh, self-organization is also out of the official agenda. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, my, I finished my presentation uh, with the words about uh, uh, the civic essence of uh, any mm, of any. Mm, 
projects uh, dealing with uh, Holocaust, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, and uh, uh, xenophobia. And uh, for me, uh, the model, uh, the model uh, case uh, for working with all this is uh, the case of uh, uh, the Latvian uh, Riga uh, Museum of Janis Lipke. Uh, right of the world, uh, which uh, opened uh, um, another institutions, the daughter institutions, which uh, which is called uh, the House of Courage, mm -hmm. dealing with the uh, courage uh, to be uh, in minority. Okay, uh, and uh, I guess that this is the future of uh, this theme, working with uh, uh, young people, with uh, um, students, uh, uh, in these uh, um, frames of uh, of civic education, uh, because all our um, topics are absolutely civic. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, your last words will not be the last words because someone else wanted the last word. Um, Obaid, uh, but, uh, and I'm very, I'm very nice, so Ahmad Obaid Al Mansour will have the last word and I will, I will close off. But you have less than a minute. I'll do my best. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, <laughs> let's remember that you know, we talk about the Holocaust, we talk about, you know, uh, the commemoration and Moria. We're talking about, we're, we're doing it so it will never happen again. Not never happen to the Jews, it's also never, happen to other, uh, never, not, never to happen to other people. It's very important to prevent it, you know. So we have one verse from the Quran, which is the same that you have there, Mishnah. You know, who saves one life, saves the whole humanity. So we say to people, you know, and the opposite is true. If you kill one life, it's like, you know, how that affects. Let, let's think of the consequences of that morally, socially, psychologically. How about if you kill six million people? You know, what, you know what, how the effect of that on the global. So the way we do it there, we have the part of commemoration of the victims, remembrance. Also the other part, to link it to the Middle East. It's very important to think, you know, not just to think of Europe or the United States, other places. Also in the Arab world, the Islamic world, it's very important to, you know, to share with them. We have the other part, we share with them about the people, the righteous among nations, people, you know, from the Islamic world, the Arab world, and other places, even from Europe, who help the Jews from the Nazis. To show them, but you know the other aspect. It's very important to show the others because there's a hope. We, we end our our gallery for uh, for the Holocaust with the hope. And about the images which are very disturbing for the children, we have cover there. So anybody wants to do it, they have their own liberty to take the cover and watch it. And it's very important that we always uh, think that the idea is not to happen again. This is the main idea. And uh, also have compassion. Also, we link this to the time of the Prophet when the Romans were defeated, uh, the Prophet and, the, and uh, by, by the pagans, the Prophet and the uh, companions, they were very upset. So God promised that the Romans will come back because this dynamic which we have with the Judaism, Christianity, and also beside the ethnicity, the kinship between Jews and the Arabs. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. I think that the source for uh, for if you save one life, you save entire humanity is in is in the Maimonides. It's in the commentary. I've I've, I've looked like crazy, but it's, it's it's in one of Maimonides' commentary. I want to thank all of our colleagues um, worldwide, literally, for uh, either coming here and sharing with us their uh, best practices or and experiences or. Uh, online, I know the heart, the, the the hardships of of being of being there online and wanting to wanting to express yourself, but knowing that you're only behind the screen, we appreciate your effort a lot. I appreciate the effort of all the people present here, and would like to thank the Russian Jewish Congress and the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center for uh, making this happen and for what I think was a very fruitful exchange of uh, best practices. Thank you very much, and I wish you a Wonderful day.